begin by thanking the World Economic Forum and, and, and congratulating all of you who have come to what is clearly the most important session and the most interesting issue that will be discussed at the World Economic Forum meeting in Dalian. Um, I am the uh, Asia business editor of The Economist. My life is consumed by China, and China, in terms of business, is consumed with the issue of intellectual property, I, it, particularly where China interacts with the rest of the world. Um, let's get certain points out of the way at the beginning. If you talk about entertainment, if you talk about uh, technology, if you talk about pharmaceuticals, if you talk about car designs, if you talk about parts, everything at the end of the day comes down to, in terms of trade, the decisive issue, the value-added issues, the big money issues, um, the integration of China into the world issues with intellectual property. So I am absolutely delighted to have these guests with us today. They will all spend a couple of minutes talking in the beginning. They will address a couple of questions. But this is also a very good opportunity to have people in the room bring their own thoughts and their own comments. And I can't encourage you enough. And breaking with many, many traditions at these sort of forums, I am almost willing to entertain people to raise their hand during comments. Because I think if you have a fresh comment, or a fresh insight or a fresh question, it's much better to hit the speaker with it while he's talking than come back to it when the train of thought has gone somewhere else. So with those brief introductory remarks, let me begin my, um, my uh, panel with uh, Mr. Sukamoto from Jetro. Thank you very much. <laughs> Two days ago, uh, we had a speech uh, from uh, Premier Wen. Uh, on his very positive attitude uh, for innovation. And innovation and uh, intellectual property right protection is very much related. Uh, even if uh, the company uh, creates very innovative product, if uh, intellectual property right uh, protection uh, cannot be done well. Uh, so uh, Premier also uh, talked about the necessity of strengthening uh, of intellectual proper, uh, property right here in China. And uh, Japanese companies uh, is now in Darlene, 3,000 companies. And uh, all over the chi China, uh, 21,000 companies. And uh, Jetro, uh, we have uh, six offices. And uh, we got the questionnaire from Japanese companies. What worries them? And uh, one of the most important uh, concern uh, of their operation here in China is intellectual property right protection. And uh, maybe I think uh, nowadays Chinese companies also are worrying uh, the uh, invasion of uh, intellectual property right. Uh, maybe I, I will listen to uh, those kind of things uh, from uh, other panelists. And uh, two things is very important uh, for intellectual property right protection in China. One is that the more strengthened uh, law uh, on intellectual property rights. Uh, that means uh, more uh, severe punishment because uh, many, many uh, intellectual right uh, invasion are uh, repeated. And uh, so a more uh, strengthened uh, the law uh, is very much needed. And also, uh, the China law had better to be more, much more harmonized uh, with international standards. And uh, those things are seriously discussed, and uh, we understand uh, very good effort of uh, Chinese uh, authorities toward this uh, strengthening the law. The second thing, uh, this is the most important thing, the implementation. Uh, even if uh, the law will be stipulated. Uh, if the implementation uh, cannot be done, uh, that is a, a really a big uh, trouble uh, for companies. And uh, so implementation requires very positive attitude of policy and uh, also very positive attitude in custom office. And uh, Japanese companies, uh, uh, in cooperation with uh, uh, Jetro, uh, having this type of book. This uh, book shows uh, in uh, many categories of the product that uh, fake one, 
and the real one. And the fake one and the real one is very similar. So how to identify the fake one is very important. So in order to smooth operation of this implementation, uh, we have this type of uh, book and uh, uh, supply them to custom office and police. And so this type of uh, implementation is very much needed and the uh, situation uh, is very uh, serious. So we really hope uh, that more strong uh, effort for implementation uh, will be done. Thank you. I, I, I just can't help myself. I have to ask for immediate follow-up. What did the authorities do with the book that you gave them? Did they immediately redress those complaints? Did they redress some of them? Did they redress none of them? I mean, given that evidence, what was the result? Uh, in case of custom office, uh, they are rather positive uh, in working. And uh, in case of police, uh, at this moment, uh, in many cases, uh, even if uh, we found uh, the case uh, in the market, for example, uh, if uh, the company, uh, in, in this case, Japanese company, cannot identify the factory itself, in what factory uh, this will be done. Then uh, uh, if uh, that factory cannot be identified, they will not work. Uh, usually, they will not work. So well, well, we uh, utilize a research company, uh, investigating company, and to identify uh, a certain factory and uh, then the police uh, can work together. Uh, because uh, many, many, we understand the difficulty because uh, many, many cases of invasion is happening. So without uh, notifying uh, the real uh, invasion, uh, the police uh, is not uh, in a position. But in case of custom office, uh, uh, if the product will come, then uh, the custom office uh, can check. And uh, that is... Uh, um, now we're going to shift to someone who, uh, who is in quite a different position. We're going to someone who actually produces in China and who has faced um, accusations of violating intellectual property and had to cope with um, all the stereotypes and all the concerns of the world being faced on their company. So why don't you discuss, Mr. Jun, why don't you discuss your situation in your company and what you produced and, and, and how the result was and what your perception is of how to deal with the external environment that exists today about intellectual property. First, I will correct myself. I should have been accused of violating intellectual property, especially in the CBIT this year. So, I think I should speak English, perhaps, because... Okay. So, <coughs> just now, um, he, what he said is before something happened at the beginning of this year, perhaps March, yeah, in Sibit of Hanover, our, <coughs> we show our MP3, our yeah, many new products in German. So as a I'm sorry. So there is a patent company uh, named the Sisvio from Italia. They thought uh, all Chinese people are copycat. copycat. So uh, anyone who is not on their name list must be illegal. So they ask the German customer to catch us. But after that, they find that is a big mistake. They find, they, they do. There is a misunderstanding because we are legal. And uh, although we not on the list, but actually uh, our partner, uh, because we only do R&D and uh, to branding, to manufacture, we have partner. So they do all the things yeah, for us. But on the list, is their name, not my name. 
So this is a misunderstanding, but they have done some bad thing. So after that, they feel very sorry because we are legal and, <clears throat> and we are good partner. And we have more than 400 patents and they want to be our agent to promote China IP to the world. So the CEO of the CISVO, uh -huh, after the misunderstanding, they fly to China and uh, in front of 200, more than 200 media, he formally uh -huh, say, I apologize to IGO about the misunderstanding, the misunderstanding in Sibit, Hanover. Yeah, after that, uh, we forgive them and uh, to be friends. <laughs> yeah, so now we worked very well because now, you know, Chinese people are very clever. <laughs> do R&D is the best, yeah. And uh, many, many foreign companies do R&D use China human results. And uh, uh, thanks for the monitoring of the international media about uh, many things, the history. And now many, uh, more and more Chinese company now are focused on R&D and uh, apply IP. So I think um, there is a little unfair for China now, a little. Uh, first, we should thank for the, all the media uh, overseas monitor what happened in China before. And uh, yesterday I see the CNN talking about um, the toy, yeah, written back, yeah, this kind of thing. And uh, many, many bad news about fast food, uh, the food safe, yeah, many, many things. Uh, thanks for monitoring. This is a good thing. But, you know, everything have two sides. Uh, now China, the government encouraging IP, encouraging branding, encouraging R&D more and more and do a, a lot of job. We know that because we can build. Compared with the history, now improve very much, yeah. But if you only see the bad news, only one side, it's unfair. So I suggest the media should see the two sides, not only monitor, but also encourage the government now what doing. Now the China government encourage many, many <laughs> this kind of thing. And uh, more and more China companies are creating new value for the consumer all over the world. Not only just uh, save money. You know, China company do a lot of work uh, save money for consumer, yeah. But not, uh, but only this is not enough. Now more and more Chinese company now uh, create new value for the reliable, high quality or good service uh, to um, to make the consumer happy and the happiness or this kind of all branding, you know. So I think um, to next year will be the Olympic. You know, 40 years ago, the Japan uh, Tokyo uh, Olympic. Before that, Japanese brand are uh, low end in the world. But after the, the Olympic, the Japanese people united together and uh, to go all over the world and uh, now successful. And 20 years ago, the Korean brands do the same thing. So now it's 10 of China. So I think Olympic will change many things. So more and more uh, Chinese people and the government and the companies uh, will <laughs> do more things about IP. So I think uh, one side monitoring, another side should give some encouragement. If, well, you agree, if you agree with me, so we can give some uh, encouragement for the China government and the Chinese brand. We'll, okay. we'll look at it another way. I think that. Uh, I think clearly you're, one of the things that you're illustrating is that the victims of intellectual property theft, do you want me to repeat with your train? You know, clearly many of the victims and many of the most serious victims of intellectual property theft are Chinese companies themselves, the ones that do all the things that in fact 
we really want companies to do, which is be genuinely innovative and create value-added products that the world demands. Um, let's take uh, a perspective from someone who comes from outside but knows China quite well, um, Mr. Shea. Now, I was told originally, I have to tell you on this panel, that he was going to be the bad guy in the panel because he would be pointing out areas of uh, maybe shortcomings. But in fact, I have to say from my point of view, and perhaps because it's uh, because I'm part of the media, I perceive him to be the good guy because it's only by reflecting on those areas where we really don't come up to our highest potential that we can actually become better. So as the good guy on the panel, Mr. Shea, we, we're all... Thank <laughs> you. Um, I don't know, uh, bad or good, I guess we're all funny combinations of those things depending on the day or the moment. Um, I'll do my best to uh, respond to the title of the topic. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the forum, um, the City of Dalian and NDRC and the government for supporting what I think is going to be a tremendously successful gathering each year in this part of the world, uh, which reflects the real topic, which is the first myth that China is an emerging economy. The reality is China is a re-emerging civilization. Why do I say that? Because in the years that I work in this industry and more recently with UCDO on innovation related policy as our main area of focus and IPR as the core within that, um, I have uh, encountered certain mindsets that reflect um, perhaps a not well formed uh, educational uh, view or historic view of, of China. Um, China has been a intellectual superpower, as we know, uh, for centuries and millennia. And China has suffered the most precipitous uh, loss of position over the last hundred years uh, for various reasons, um, largely due to the emerging interaction of the world. And now China is on the most precipitous rebound that we've ever seen in world history. Where was it and where did this loftiness of this civilization come from? It came from intellectual side of intellectual property. Where did its undoing or its current uh, challenge emerge from? From the notion of property, which is a uh, more recently evolved from Western um, uh, market-based systems, a uh, way of codifying relationships in economy. Um, this is something which is not traditionally as developed in China or developed really at all in the past. There are other ways of taking care of problems, but they weren't necessarily through courts and legal systems historically. China is in the midst of grappling with this uh, core challenge to move from low intellectual asset to high intellectual asset economy, and it forms the basis of the Zhuzhu Chuanxin policy or the indigenous innovation policy. So we're really at an inflection point here in this re-emerging civilization. It uh, is, uh, can, it leads us to a second myth uh, that China doesn't get it about IPR. Uh, that's a myth. Um, it, if you broaden the sense of intellectual property to include what might be a broader category of intellectual asset, which includes, in addition to IPR, patent, trademark, copyright, the major areas of challenge now, um, includes intangibles. Intangibles like uh, business process, brand value, um, and trade secret. Uh, you'll see that in the past, much of Chinese innovation has been, in fact, part of a social global common, going off through the Silk Road to the to points further, uh, further east and west, and powering much of what was later claimed to be invention and patented in, in other economies. Uh, the work of John Needham from Cambridge is quite profound on this, showing invented in the West, and then a thousand years earlier, actually really invented in China, and, and, and led through uh, avenues of trade and communication to become a part of a global uh, basis for further innovation. So it, it has always been an economic power powered by intellectual assets, mostly in the area of trade secrets. Um, you know, t traditional Chinese medicine, silk processing, and so forth, uh, paper itself, which eventually are no longer secrets and, you know, you, you, the economic entity that was engaged in it, um, its position shifts. So the second myth that it doesn't get it, it does. Um, that it's not responsive uh, sufficiently, is a third myth, to the con global concerns about IPR. Well, that's, if you live and work in China, you know that there's tremendous work being done in bringing the IP side, according to global legal parameters, into line. So that in, both in the area of uh, ongoing reform in legislation and regulation, in the core IP of patent, trademark, and copyright, there's constant evolution, it's ongoing as we speak, and it's coming largely in compliance with global practice, including TRIPS. 
Having said all that, I don't know if that makes me a good guy or a bad guy, but uh, one has to recognize this, um, that this is core to China's moving on from a high volume, low margin treadmill to a higher valued, uh, you know, distributed economy uh, to secure the, the, uh, the jobs and the taxes and everything that an economy needs. So this is clear. The huge challenge, though, has been articulated, is at the local level, is at the level of implementation, is at the level of uh, the local infringement on the coast, let's say, in the southern part of China, where you have orders coming from offshore to replicate this. Uh, and, oh, fine, sure, well, let's do this. And the, the people involved in that uh, value chain are not very conversant with nor particularly concerned about international uh, strictures and legal, uh, legal parameters. Um, they're just concerned to beat out the other 50 shops down the street. Uh, so, so you have this uh, huge uh, systemic problem, which is actually, despite the best efforts at the legal, at the national level, in the judiciary and the, the, the other branches of government, is, if anything, expanding in scope and expanding in severity. So this then leads on to uh, problems that come with uh, inauthentic goods, problems of quality, problems of reliability in product and service, and recently we've seen that the awareness of this has become a huge global issue. So in China, the problem is at the local level. How is it that we can uh, work collectively as major trading partners in assisting and uh, furthering the enterprise of the national authorities and the local authorities in uh, raising awareness, in putting the spotlight on best practice, um, in, in uh, you know, encouraging um, a change in, you might say, cultural, social, um, awareness and attitude about what is intellectual asset, what is intellectual property, and how is it that this is the way forward. Um, and there are a number of pilot initiatives which we're working on as well um, at the local level, uh, which is perhaps part of a, a separate conversation, which actually are looking at going beyond talking and doing some doing, special innovation zones, special kinds of arrangements. So all of this is innovation about innovation. And what I'm confident in is that it is happening in China and it will um, it will have a rocky road for five or ten years, definitely. Uh, but those that stick with it, both within China and the major partners of China, will realize the benefits uh, going forward. Thank you. Let, let me just follow on one thing you said. You said the problems are at the local level, and the person who's producing at the local level is primarily concerned with the shops down the street who are potentially competing with them. How much interest is there really then at the local level to take the kind of steps that you want them to take? And, and what is really the leverage of the central government on those local producers, given their structural nature? It's an excellent question. There are perhaps 90% or more of patent cases, infringement cases, are Chinese on Chinese. So you need to have an awareness at every level that this is a serious problem that's holding back the country from developing. That The seeds of that are there. Um, the problem with m moving faster on that is that it's a delicate issue, but the judiciary, the legal system, is not as independent as it needs to be from the political system in China. Um, and that is most problematic at the local level. So uh, that really calls for uh, more than increasing penalties at the national level. Um, that calls for some very profound um, reinvention, essentially, of some of the systems here. Um, how do we get there? Uh, you have to have a situation where local interests, in the meantime, you have to be working on awareness and, um, of course, increased penalties and so forth, decreased timelines. Part of the problem is that the, even if the penalties are being increased, it will take you three years of effort and energy to get to a, a resolution. That has to do with local level uh, compromising of, let's say, the efficiency of the system, if maybe the integrity of the system. Well, not to leave this with too bleak a note. Well, yes, to leave it with a bleak note. If you're talking about changing the entire local judiciary um, and their enforcement, wouldn't that be a, um, wouldn't the timeline that you have be one of generations rather than merely I, months or I years? I don't think it's generational. I, I think it's not changing the system because, in fact, the, uh, the judges are now more educated than before. Um, there, we see these exchanges with the U.S. Patent Trade Office, for example. There, there's very encouraging uh, signs of seriousness uh, and also of capacity and the, the awareness of the need to build the capacity. But at the end of the day, you still have a structure uh, in, the, in the society where the judiciary is appointed and beholden to uh, another source of power. 
and that, that is a difficult issue to confront. And it's not alone in China. Most economies are like that, actually. And it's those that perhaps one could argue that sustainable innovation in the developed economies, which China is benchmarking, is one of the critical success factors, necessary preconditions, is a uh, sovereignty in that area, is, a, is an independence of review. So that is, not, and then the question, is that generational? I don't think it is. Um, I think that it is in the scope more of uh, years than decades. Um, and because there are certain indications of that. Uh, but how is it that we can work to accelerate that awareness and build that capacity uh, to bring that closer? Let's come back to that. Um, but I just want to mark that this is a revolutionary panel that we have up here. Um, Mr. Shao, would you like to talk about your experiences with intellectual property? Uh,我觉得知识产权保护了不光是中国的问题,也是个世界各国的问题。这个,我去年下半年以来呢,现在一直很困惑。就是这个,我们也发现了,这个来自西方的,这个非常发达国家的,有三家公司。这个,侵
，企业拥有知识产权，你可以做到持有。哎。Have Have you ever had any threats within China to your own intellectual property? Have you had other Chinese companies ever try to infringe on what you perceive to be your intellectual property? And if so, what was your experience trying to bring that under control? 呃，过去确实来讲也发现很多，就是国内的公司呢，确实侵犯我们很多知识产权。这个当初呢，给了走了发明的技术，希望呢能够迅速的走向市场。所以这方面呢，我们还是很善意的，对这个侵权者呢，就是呢，我们先暂时放他一马，呃，叫他先做，帮我们扩大市场。哎，这种办法还比较灵的。过去来讲，吆喝这个产业呢，是我一个人在吆喝。这大家知道来讲，可能九幺幺用到我们的发光材料，使美很多。美国人很多时报中心大人，很多一万八千人能够迅速撤离，那这当时就是我们发明这个这个发光材料。哎，后来也很多中国公司呢也在在仿造在生产，这个呃，但是来讲这个材料由于大家的这个当时我们在这个产权方面放一马以后呢，很多公司来开发其他领域的应用，这个包括在这个这个地这个城市地名标牌，包括在塑料涂料，包括在化妆品上，可能有些公司在开发。这个，所以来讲这方面，我觉得知识产权呢有这个方面呢，就是一个希望这公司呢能够尊重知识产权；第二个来讲，对这个这个行业呢能进入者呢，这个在一定时期你可以放一马。这个我觉得来讲是我过去经验，这样大家把这个市场帮你做起来了。但是企业要做到一定程度，但是你必须守规矩。哎，这个这个开始的小时候你可以偷一偷做一做，但是要做大了，那你必须来讲这个要尊重法律。尊重别人的创造，哎，这个是自己的能够企业能够很好的健康发展。So before I turn this over to the audience, and I and I hope you have some questions, let me just follow up on that comment. I guess your approach is let people steal it for a while. I don't want to mischaracterize your answer. I, 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 you know, this is. I think companies have a real debate. Do they sue? Do they bring into court? Are they friendly? Should they try to do a business deal with the people who are taking their intellectual property? I mean, how do you respond in the most effective way? But if your argument is you should just let them have it, is that your? How does the rest of the panel respond to that that approach? First of all, I would suggest that one of the best ways of bringing forward um, IP culture, if you will. Is to have gentlemen like Mr. Xiang and Mr. Feng on the circuit in China, uh, because they've articulated so well why those shops should be moving towards real meat and from soup to meat, uh, very, very clearly. And, and I commend them on that. Um, and, and I think to to your point, um, there was a, I, I believe, I, I'm not sure if I have this right, but a, the head of a very famous American software company once said, "As long as it's my product in the early days, um, we'll we'll think about." Getting more uh, return as they uh, become more aware of our product later on. I think people know the quote that I'm referring to, uh, attributed to to Bill Gates. Actually, that in the early days there was ma massive copying, of course, of Microsoft software. And, um, I don't know whether that's uh, uh, apocryphal or not, but it does illustrate the point that in early paradigm-changing adoption of technology and solution to meet human needs, there is an awareness curve. And there's a huge marketing cost for uh, pioneers, uh, so that it may be in the calculation, in this case, or, or perhaps even in the case of the early adoption of software, um, that it does make sense to try to bring the infringer as a channel partner or in some other way work out a, a uh, modus vivendi. Um, and where it becomes more uh, difficult is, as the uh, chairman was suggesting, when they become large and uh, it becomes more of a serious uh, threat to the market position of your interest. Then you need to have a recourse. At some point along the line, it goes from a, a, you know makes a net benefit to marketing and awareness to being uh, not beneficial. And so you need to have a system where those interests can be brought in the same uh, focal point and the, uh, a clear and uh, understandable, transparent process for resolving these disputes. Let, let me. W would anyone else like to comment on this issue? I mean, you know, from a point of view of economic incentives, in some ways, it's, this is a massively offensive idea. What you're saying is, you should, um, if you steal someone's, if you steal someone's intellectual property, 
the correct response of the person you stole from is to do a deal with you. So you are then rewarded twice over for the fact that you, you stole. Now, I'm, I'm not suggesting way, that as, as the right thing. I'm just saying that that is what is happening that in is, the frontier yeah. economy. And the calculation of the economic interests, and everyone who's active in China knows that this is the case, there has to be a point where uh, the infringement, when it becomes serious, can be resolved. And that is still underdeveloped in China. And that's the gap for China to get ahead. Did, did anyone else on this panel want to? Yeah. In Japan also, uh, we had a similar problem, uh, especially uh, new uh, commerce uh, to the market. Uh, they are very much uh, concentrating on uh, the product itself. And uh, so how to protect their uh, intellectual property right uh, is uh, sometimes uh, not so well uh, prepared. And so uh, the, in Japan, uh, the government is now uh, launching a uh, new uh, strategic uh, policy on uh, intellectual property right uh, protection and year 2002 and uh, uh, the system uh, is uh, very much improved and uh, also uh, as he said uh, basically uh, this type of problem is occurring uh, in everywhere and so uh, important thing is uh, the, uh, the protection uh, effort uh, of the company also uh, is very important and also uh, the government uh, will uh, require to be very very uh, Responsible uh, for that. Let me look to the. Oh, yes, of course. Yeah. Uh, 刚才在这一点呢，就刚才就是说这个这个知识产权。刚才就是先像刚才包括这个莎尔也说了，包括美国很多著名公司先放你一马，叫你先做。我觉得这个来讲，可能跟偷东西的比例还不太相似。这个知识产权来讲呢，应该毕竟呢，它跟一般的这个
concern itself with, uh, it's an excellent question. And I, as a reporter myself, I, I would be very curious if I was writing about his company to address those issues. But this panel is devoted to intellectual property. Yeah. And therefore, I'd really like to constrain all the comments and all the questions to intellectual property. And I don't mean to be rude by cutting you off because I, I'm, I'm interested as well. In, in fact, can we have you take that question up after this panel is over? Because unless the answer is an intellectually oriented you don't have the technology or you can't license it or something like that. Uh,对啊,所以刚才说的发光材料我们拥有的知识产权,但是这个LED芯片方面我们这没有,所以但是我们要通过一些合法的手机,我们来获得这些东西,所以在2003年大家知道了我们通过鉴定,把美国一家
都签好合同了，那么他是如果是侵权的话，那如果在合同他是保密范围内的话，那他就是侵权。中国的法律体系有这个解决方式。现在糟糕的是，您可能不知道，你要随便多看看 CNN 你就知道了。现在整天只有中国的坏消息，没有一条好消息。这个过了，你知道吗？什么事情都不能过头。你不知道中国现在损失有多大，所以不好意思啊，我可能没有直接回答你的问题。那我要回答你的问题，从我这儿就一句话：法律问题，法律解决。Have you been able？ 所以在中国来讲的话，解决这个问题来讲，嗯，跟在国外解决这个问题现在是一样的，其实是一样。中国现在是法治国家。过去曾经确实我们有不好的地方，我们非常感谢别人好朋友。其实他刚才问是好人还是坏人，我觉得他是好人。他其实从内心深处，他希望中国能够重视知识产权。其实我们所有中国的企业来讲，也都是站在一个希望中国的知识产权能够起来的一个角度。那么其实对于中国的企业的崛起，绝对是好事但是现在来讲的话，出现的一个问题是，嗯，所以中国的食品一律不能吃。认为中国的知识产权一律被盗版。其实，现在我所看到的是，那么中国知识产权的问题确实有，也有很多不争气的公司在丢中国的脸。但是呢，其实来讲，中国也有很多好的公司，包括刚才那个陆明、那个肖总。但是实际上来讲的话，我们看到海外的对对他们的这个报道几乎为零。所以呢，我在这里呢，其实因为既有国内的媒体，有国外的媒体，所以我在这里建议的话，是关注一下。好吧，所以你的问题就一个答案，就是嗯，法律问题，法律解决，在中国是能解决。Thank you. For future answers, we only have about six minutes left, so it's very important to okay, make concise you. answers, and it's also very important to try to answer the question that is being asked. And I, I think the points you raised about China are very important and very good I'm points. I'm so sorry. That was a legal question, and and so let me, if you can answer this in just under one minute, I'd like you to address that. 我觉得来讲呢，现在来讲这个困惑呢，不管中国公国外公司也是这样，由于员工的离职，把把技术带跑了，把专利给带跑带走了。但是我希望呢，在专利保护法中能增加一个，对于挖人的这些公司，也是有连带责任的。就是过去来讲，就是这个员工离职，把专利把技术带走了，应该说也侵犯了《反不正当法》，也侵犯了一些相关法律。但是你参与这个事情的一些公司员工。包括一些猎头，你是不是也应该承担一些法律责任？所以是不是我觉得是不是应该增加一些这方面的一些就是连带责任的追究？ Well, that that was a terrific question. Does, does anyone? Some of these orders are again coming from offshore to have people that are well known and capable engineers to go in, and especially in the software design mask area. The problem in China. Is a very serious problem because the scope and scale and, uh, and range of products that are being infringed is, is increasing, and, and just as the Chinese industrial capacity is is increasing, so there there are companies that are very concerned in those sectors that I mentioned, um, and are starting mandates here to be close to the market and develop products here and, and enjoy all the benefits. Um, that this this uh, situation is very real, both in terms of infringement after production and release in the marketplace. But increasingly, infringement from within. It is a global phenomenon. But the difference is that more mandates are here, and more engineers are here, um, and so more interests are intriguing, in a sense, to get at those individuals um, and use them as a means to uh, steal the march on a competitor. Well, this is human capital, isn't it? That was a fantastic question. Is, is there? What was the next question? Oh, I see more and more hands up. Well, the in the yes, the man with the beard in the, yes. There has been increasing debate in the United States about the proper extent of patents, in particular. Uh, you know, it's well, well known, as as uh, as Mr. Jiguo noted a few minutes ago, that ideas are not property. If someone takes your quote unquote takes your idea, you have not lost your idea; you've lost nothing. Another indication that it's not regarded as property is that it's always for a limited term. The world is full of, of ideas. Civilization is based on the sharing of ideas, and patent has always been a right to sue someone for for a period of time. That is not ownership of an idea. So, that recognition and the sense that patents do in, impede innovation in many instances. Imagine patents on recipes for dinners. Uh, the extension of patents to software is a very good example. There's a broad consensus that that has inhibited innovation. So my question is: Is there a debate in China 
about the right way to think about this. Is it property? I think not. Is it theft? I think not. You have a different language. Perhaps you should have a different translation. And regarding what should be patentable, is it your intention to follow the United States in every detail or to reach your own conclusions? Well, that is truly, truly a massive question. Well,我觉得现在来讲，可能中国也也存在这个讨论，就是专利是不是主带来这种创新、转带发展。我本人是做技术工作的，这些年来就是非常感触的。专利来讲，应该说来讲，虽然它会影响一些创新，但是呢，
。如果单纯的就是打击，任何一个孩子也成长不起来的。美国人之所以引以为荣的就是 American Dream， 就是美国梦。那么其实难道中国不可能有中国梦吗？所以在这里面呢，我还是想占这点宝贵的时间，能够找回这个平衡。Yeah, we we yeah, actually okay. have. We are now out of. I'm so sorry if you haven't been able to ask a question. We, but according to the rules of this, um, each person gets one minute. Now I have no idea how to enforce, you know, one minute sorry, with this yeah. panel. But sorry. patent enforcement is simple compared to making people. But let me give each person 60 seconds. Going back this way, could we start with you with just 60 seconds? Oh, I think, in China, I agree with Mr. Feng 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 就是中国来讲呢，也不是说像外界所传达的一塌糊涂，中国人侵犯专利啊，侵犯知识产权呐、啊。我觉得中国很多优秀的公司，尤其想做这个呃百年老店公司，想做成长性公司，他们还大部分比较守法的，这是一个。第二个，中国的知识产权类也可以对外进行许可，比如说我陆明，我觉得很高兴的讲，三个月前我们呢给日本一家公司进行专利的许可，那可能是在这个可能过去是不敢想象的。So, the creation of China should also be recognized by the world's respect, and the world's respect. Thank you. Thank you. I have no doubt uh, about the uh, future uh, potential of Chinese companies uh, for innovation. Uh, that is very important. But at the same time, uh, the, this uh, issue, uh, intellectual property right issue, is very much relating to protect that kind of uh, innovation. Uh, but at this moment, I think uh, we had better very serious uh, to understand the situation and the uh, implementation in the everywhere uh, uh, in China. Uh, not only in China, of course, uh, in Japan also. Uh, everywhere uh, we have to pay very serious effort uh, how to Im implement and enforce uh, in order to protect uh, those types of uh, very innovative uh, thinking. Uh, that is very important. Mr. I think we're very privileged today to be witnessing in China, in New Dalian and old ancient China, the rebirth of a great civilization. We're in a renaissance, which means rebirth, which is as profound as any other in human history. Um, your comment on the baby. Um, the, the key for way forward for China to move from uh, basic uh, meeting of the economic needs uh, to uh, full rebirth is in finding a protocol, a means that is socially understood and implemented for recognizing the energies of these great entrepreneurs and giving a balance of their interests and, of course, the, the, the interests of users. So this, and it will be dynamic and will not necessarily be templated on any one place, but it, and it is happening. Um, it is a huge challenge and it requires tremendous collective uh, effort and fraternity, as it were, uh, to realize that full rebirthing of that, that ancient mother again, uh, the Chinese civilization, um, and, and working with the Japanese, Europeans, and Americans, and everyone else together on that. It's not, it's not easy. It's hard work. Um, but let's remember that uh, the benefits far outweigh anything that we can imagine. I think we should be confident. Don't be confident. We have a lot of problems. We have a lot of problems. 而且我们也痛恨那些盗版，痛恨侵犯我们知识产权的人，我们非常痛恨。但是呢，并不意味着我们痛恨，然后呢，我们在全世界面前只谈我们的问题，而不去向全世界展现。其实中国现在正在积极的在走向鼓励创新，整个国家的现在都是在要十五年之内变成创新型国家，天天电视上天天都是这个，而且整个知识产权的保护环境越来越好。这个事实是不容忽视的。那么老外实际上看不到，这次有达沃斯的机会，其实全世界都在看中国。其实呢，我们想，一方面呢，我们要自省，我们要自珍，我们要珍爱自己的，自己的作为一个中国的企业的一个身份。同时呢，我们也可以看日本的历史、韩国的历史。同时呢，我觉得更重要的是能够相互激励。那么利用。运用好国家现在不断增加的知识产权保护的这么一个好的环境，同时呢，能够跟全世界有一个更深入的沟通、更了解的沟通，让世界看到一个真正的中国，一个变化中的中国，也预祝中国和全世界的知识产权能够形成一加一，两个一的目标是一致的，然后呢，定位又不同，有互补，成为 one plus one equal to eleven。
we can create new value for the world. Thank you. Well, I, I think we've certainly seen the passion of the Chinese entrepreneurs here. Um, I, I want to say that uh, I want to give particular thanks to the reporter who asked the question because I think that really the issues of people leaving companies with information, the issues of patents being potentially overly restrictive, the issues of litigation and how do you enforce these things, these are difficult issues that no country has a monopoly on. No country has answered. It is not as if you went to America or France or Britain and got the answer. In fact, these are struggles. The Patent Office in the United States is under tremendous scrutiny right now because of its failures. The only way for these things to be resolved is for forthright debate. And therefore, um, I, I want to thank the Davos um, group for allowing this panel to happen. And I want to encourage these very, very difficult questions to be raised by the press. And I think that the Chinese will be stronger as they embrace these questions because they're inevitable things that not only they have to cope with, but the rest of the world has to cope with as well. And there's no reason why the legal and intellectual innovations for controlling this sort of property couldn't come from Beijing and Dalian and Shenzhen as much as it does from Washington or Paris or Britain, as long as people are willing to confront these very fractious, complicated problems and try to work to resolve them. But anyway, thank you very, very much for the panel for coming here, and thank you for all the audience as well. Bye-bye.